Do you remember when Tesla was laughed off the stage because they were a Silicon Valley software company attempting to do hardware and cars? And that was all Detroit and Berlin and Tokyo's business. Well, now look what's happening. We've got all the traditional car manufacturers that are crying about the fact that they can't make software and that they have to learn how to make software from the ground up and vertically integrate everything after years of farming everything out. Who's laughing now? Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So this video actually comes from, was inspired by a Robert Llewellyn and Jim Farley interview that they, that Robert did for Fully Charged Live. It's an amazing interview. Of course, I will leave the entire thing in the description, the link to the entire, of course, I'll leave a link to the entire thing in the description so you can check it out. It's about 45 minutes long, I believe. Anyway, I'm going to take a cutting that's somewhere around 90 seconds to two minutes. I'll try to cut it down as much as possible because I hate to use other people's stuff in bulk. But anyway, I, I highly recommend going and watching that video. But I want to start off with this because it really, really speaks to, number one, thank you to Jim Farley for being so honest about all this stuff. But number two, it really, really speaks to the mistakes that Legacy Auto made in terms of not understanding how important software was going to be to the future, and simultaneously not understanding what a bind it was going to put them in to not vertically integrate. Yeah. So to say probably $500 a vehicle, or let's say 350 quid a vehicle, Yeah. We, we farmed out all the modules that control the vehicles to our suppliers because we could bid them against each other. So Bosch would do the body control module. Someone else would do the seat control module. Someone else would do the engine control module. Right. And, and we'd have about 150 of these modules with semiconductors all through the car. The problem is the software are all written by, you know, 150 different companies. And they don't talk to each other. Right. And so even though it says Ford on the front, yeah. I actually have to go to Bosch to get permission to change their seat control software. It's actually their IP. And I have 150, we call it the loose confederation of software providers, 150 completely different wow. software programming languages. You know, all the structure of the software is different. It's millions of code and we can't even understand it all. You know, that's why at Ford, we've decided in the second generation product to completely insource the electric architecture. Right. And to do that, you need to write all the software yourself. But just remember car companies haven't written software like this. They've yes. never written software. So we're literally writing how the vehicle operates, the software to operate the vehicle for the first time ever. Yeah. And my dad had a Ford when I was a kid and, mm. you know, it was just that way and they worked and that was fine and everybody understood how they worked. And now suddenly it's a, it is a, it's a different machine. I've always said this. It is. A, oh, for sure. And that's the big challenge for companies like Ford to Make That's that why transition. I had to split the, the business. I had to split the company into three pieces because right. I kept watching our ICE engineers try to figure out, you know, how to do over their updates or change the software for the vehicle. You know, they, they didn't know they're not software people. Yeah. So we had to attract new talent. You know, you need a mix of traditional people, but, you know, you got to make that decision. Do you cut and do it all yourself? Yeah. Or do you keep, or you keep trying with these, you know, modules in your supply chain. Yeah. And I, I watch way too many companies continue to try. I won't name the names because they're competitors, but it's shocking to me, yeah. you know, how many people are sticking with very old electric architectures and software from other people, Confederacy. All right, so even in that short little segment, there's an awful lot to unpack. Basically, the problem is that you've got a situation where Legacy Auto was in a relatively steady state for decades and decades and decades, maybe since the 1950s or 60s. You're looking at very small. The last really big you know, thing that happened was the 1970s when Japan came in and kind of blew up Detroit. But OK, so maybe we call it that. So maybe like the early to mid 1980s, there was a changeover. There's electronic fuel injection. There was all of that kind of stuff. But since then, until the early 20 teens, mid 20 teens or so, there was a very steady state for 30 plus years of car manufacturers just basically making the same thing and just making little tiny changes to it every couple of years. And when you do that, the people who are in charge, and Sandy Monroe harps on this all the time. I love it when he talks about this. He's like, those MBAs from Harvard, he always gets mad about that. But the basic idea was when you're in a steady state and you are competing 
in a world where every dollar counts and that's what really makes a difference, you advertise a lot so that you can convince people that your car somehow is better, even though it's the, pretty much exactly the same as everybody else's car. Um, so that's the brand awareness and advertising stuff. But then what you do is you farm out things. If you can save five bucks by not manufacturing a chip, but instead farming that out to another entity, then you save the five dollars because you've saved five bucks off of every car. And if you make a million of these vehicles, then you've saved five billion dollars. And that's a really great thing. And then if you multiply that times a whole bunch of these, you end up saving a whole bunch of money. What happened in the early 20 teens was Tesla. And on top of that, of course, is like, you know, Chinese manufacturers and others that are coming in behind Tesla and picking up on what Tesla is doing. <clears throat> and what Tesla did instead was they said, we are a software company. You know, Elon Musk has, has very clearly said that when they started, he and J.B. Straubel started making cars, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. They were a software company. They knew how to make software and they didn't know how to make cars. And it was a huge learning curve and they almost went bankrupt twice in like 2008, eight nine, and then again in 2018 when they tried to ramp the Model 3. Uh, but in that process, of course, they had to learn how to make hardware. But the big sort of transition, the thing that changed and that Legacy to Auto didn't understand was that we were moving from a traditional sort of hardware-centric mode into a more electronic software-centric mode. Now, that was happening in the auto industry, but really, really slowly. Things like um, anti-lock braking, traction control, the entertainment systems that everybody has, you know, with the little tiny screens and all the wheels and knobs and everything. All of that stuff was slowly incremental. It started with fuel injection, honestly, because that's computer controlled as well. But all of that was slowly and incrementally changing the landscape, but nobody was realizing what was happening because it was happening slowly. And when something happens on a five-year cycle, then you can go to your supplier like Bosch or something like that, and you can say, hey, guys, Two years from now, we're going to want a new airbag deployment system chip or something. And Bosch can say, okay, and then they can iterate on the software. You can do all of your testing and you can figure out the best way to do that. And you can implement it 24 months later. No problem at all. What's happened in you know since Tesla came along specifically is that they're vertically integrated. They can say, oh, we need to make a change to this software that runs this chip. We own the IP. We own a lot of these chips and everything. We use a different system than these traditional legacy auto manufacturers. So we can make the change on anything from maybe a month down to just a couple of hours. They can make the change. And you saw a massive, massive benefit to this for Tesla during the pandemic and then the chip shortage because Tesla was able to take the any chips that they could get a hold of and rewrite the software. Now, I don't know how exactly they got around the IP for this, but they probably just had deals where they're like, look, we're going to buy the chips. We just want the hardware. We don't want your software. We'll write the software. That is not, as you heard Jim Farley say, they just didn't have software people. They, they farmed that stuff out. They're like, to whatever their suppliers were, they're like, you supply us the, the turnkey solution. If it's an airbag deployment, things. So you give us the chip, you give us the, the 10,000 lines of code or 20,000 lines of code that it takes to run that chip. And that's all yours. We will stick it in the car. We'll put our branding on it. Uh, you know, Jim, at one point, he really, it's amazing how honest this guy is. And I really love it in terms of CEOs. Like after Elon Musk, he is the most honest person out there. And he's like, look, we, we put our badging on a bunch of stuff that other people did. And that has clearly got to change. So what's changed, of course, is the pace of innovation. You can't innovate when you have 150 different companies that have their own IP, <clears throat> their own alignment. They want to make their own profits. They want to make things as cheaply as possible themselves. They want to be in control of their destiny. And that doesn't necessarily align with the, the like Ford's uh, you know, direction of, of path. People talk about AI alignment a lot, but alignment is actually a really, really big thing in politics. It's a big thing in business. It's a big thing clearly when you're not vertically integrated is that you don't have alignment between these companies. And because you don't, there's tension. And if, even if you are relatively well aligned, there's still just a time gap that's going to take 
to ask to make the request to understand what that request is, describe it to the other company for them to make the changes, then to go back to you again. Then you're like, nope, that's not quite right. And you keep iterating like this. And it's just everything is weeks or months apart and things take a really long time. In Tesla, you could literally, you know, the engineer can be on the floor. Elon is very about that. He's like, the engineers have offices that overlook the factory. So if they need to run downstairs and take a look at something, they will go downstairs and take a look at something and they'll fix it right there. Uh, you know, so instead of taking months to do something, it can take hours. And that magnitude of iterative ability that comes from vertically integrating as much as Tesla does, and specifically from their software experience. So again, bad hardware manufacturers, as it started, they had no idea what they were doing, but they've learned how to manufacture hardware, and they use software to help them do that. That's a huge part of what they do is have a very machine learning AI-based factory floor and the way that everything is operating so that they're really, really fast. But the consequence of that is that what they've done is they're doing hardware manufacturing and iteration at the speed of software. I think Sandy Monroe once, once called it the speed of thought, which is a really good way of putting it. But basically, you know, software is like that. You can make changes to software relatively quickly, very difficult to do with hardware. But as you are able to manufacture hardware at software speeds, if you're able to iterate on that by having the immense software expertise that you've got, and being able to vertically integrate that with as much hardware control as possible, that means that Tesla has a massive advantage. And what you're hearing, not just from Jim Farley, but also from, um, from Mary Barra, is finally starting to agree to this, is that this lack of vertical integration, this lack of foresight on their part, has put them very, very far behind Tesla and Chinese manufacturers that have also figured out how to be as agile as possible in doing this hardware manufacturing with software control and that it's something that they have to catch up on. Jim, you know, he talked about how they have to hire a ton of new software people that they didn't even know they needed a few years ago. And they've had to go to like mining and everything. They've had to get involved in things like mining and, and scaling up battery production, all of that as well. So it's a very different landscape. It used to be that you would buy pretty much everything. The auto manufacturers would buy everything from everybody else, and then they would put it together. They were assemblers of other people's stuff. That doesn't work anymore because you simply can't iterate fast enough. Now, what Jim has said and what Mary Barra has actually started to say as well is that what we're looking at is around 2030 before these companies believe that they're going to reach price parity with Tesla, which is kind of funny because it's their, I think what they're thinking is if Tesla just stops right now, that they'll be able to catch them by 2030. That's seven years away. But Tesla's clearly not going to be stopping with that, but also just to gain uh, uh, the ability to be profitable. So uh, Jim Farley has said that he, for a while, they were saying they're Gen 2 vehicles after the F-150 Lightning and the Mach-E, which by the way, the electric Viking said the Mach-E is not selling well at all, which is very scary because I think the problem of course is that you've got Tesla that is just killing them in terms of price and everything. You've got these Model Ys that are way, way cheaper. Uh, for the quality of the car than the Ford Mustang Mach-E. So it's very difficult to make a sale of the Mach-E when people are like, well, I'll just get something that's better. But anyway, regardless of that, they were saying that Gen 2 vehicles, their next generation of electric vehicles, were going to be the ones that were going to be break-even and profitable. Now he's starting to say Gen 2 or Gen 3, which indicates to me that what we're looking at is potentially the next generation after that. And these things all take, a, you know, five to seven years to cycle through and create. So they're probably at very, very early stage development of their Gen 3 vehicles. So, you know, they've got significant problems coming up. GM is in the same in the same boat, but even worse because they haven't been quite as forward thinking and they're not as honest about all of this. And Jim Farley clearly goes after them at one point. He's like, oh yeah, there's companies, there's competitors that are trying to put out 27 different models. And I believe that's the exact number that GM has said that, or used to say that they were going to put out. And instead of focusing on a couple of category killers, that's what they need to do. Tesla has clearly shown that that is also the way to go because you get massive benefits of scalability. You have, you, if you're producing only one vehicle at a factory, you can focus all of your energy on producing that vehicle, or at least, you know, just one or two. As a opposed to trying to create a whole bunch of different ones and within those different ones have a bunch of different trims and within that have a bunch of different options and things that all reduces the ability to scale as effectively as possible. So these companies are learning how to operate in a more modern and agile manner, but they've got a huge amount of backlog of employees, of legacy factories, 
of legacy ways of doing things. Jim Farley at one point talked about how the, the company itself tried many, many times to kill the F-150 Lightning project. And if you think about that, well, <laughs> what a disaster that would have been. And how uh, the vehicle to grid uh, uh, charging capability or vehicle house charging capability of the F-150 Lightning was kind of an afterthought. And that turned out to be the biggest selling point of the F-150 Lightning. So, you know, it's, it's just interesting how he, I love the fact that he's so honest. And I really hope for the best from uh, Ford, because I think that that honesty and having a forward looking CEO is great. And he's also talking about just fitting into niches where other competitors aren't like commercial vehicles and things. So all of that is to the good. But what it means is that like Ford, I think what Ford is thinking is can't compete with Tesla, probably can't compete with the major Chinese brands. What we're going to do is fill in the gaps after that. We'll find niche markets that we can go into. And then what we will do is collect the scraps that the vacuum left by Toyota and GM, potentially Volkswagen and others is going to leave as they start either going bankrupt or reducing their, their ability to produce cars drastically as they're not competitive anymore. There is going to be a vacuum, and Tesla's not going to fill all of it, and Chinese car companies, I think, probably hope that they will. But I think what Ford is saying is hopefully we'll be able to fill in some of that gap too. So Ford has got the right strategy, but you can see that a huge mistake was made 30-plus years ago, 35 years ago or so, by, by doing this thing where you're distributing all of your manufacturing and having everybody else have their hands in the pie and having a say in exactly how everything is done, when you do something like that, the inevitable consequence is it works great when everything is very steady state and you're, you're talking about saving five bucks here and there. But when everything gets disrupted, what you've done is you've set yourself up to be disrupted. And when you get disrupted, it's going to be devastating. So that's that's where we are. The, the Silicon Valley company that didn't know how to make hardware and was a joke and was laughed off of stage is now the ones saying like, hey, we manufacture hardware just like people do software. And that was our brilliance. And yeah, we almost went bankrupt a couple of times, but we didn't. And now we are eating everybody else's lunch and everybody else is really starting to suffer. And, and uh, you know, justifiably, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you set yourself up to be disrupted by distributing all of your manufacturing and just becoming essentially a boxing facility and you don't have software expertise and you don't see the future coming, then you deserve to be disrupted. I, I personally believe with Jim Farley in the lead that they are the best placed legacy auto manufacturer to survive this decade, but it also means that they are going to have to readjust their sites. And, uh, you know, they've always been, well, at least for a long time, they've been second fiddle to bigger companies like GM and Volkswagen and stuff. But so they're used to playing in that field, and I think that they'll be fine playing a second fiddle to companies like Tesla and BYD. Uh, but so they're they're relatively well placed, and I think that they'll probably survive if they can figure out how to actually make a profit instead of gigantic losses on their EVs. But the other companies that are still not even admitting that this is a problem are really having issues, and they are starting to admit there's problems because. You can only hide so long behind chip shortages and dealerships, stuffing dealership channels. And I think we're seeing a lot of companies like GM and Toyota and even VW coming up against the reality that they are going to have to tell their shareholders the truth that they're just not selling vehicles like they were before. And that is going to be a significant problem. All right, so that's my thoughts on all of this. Again, I highly recommend watching the fully charged interview. Robert is an amazing interviewer, and Jim is incredibly honest, and it's a really, really amazing thing. In the meantime, if you did enjoy this video, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. And also, my mom's surgery is later today, so hopefully things will go well. So anyway, good thoughts and good prayers from, from you all would be wonderful and I would appreciate that. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon, my YouTube channel members, and my Twitter subscribers. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel in any way you can. Don't forget about the merch store. We have a, a lot of amazing stuff. There's a link in the description. You can check that out as well. And also don't forget about the fact that we are Tesla and Amazon affiliates. And now if you purchase a car and you use my referral code, you get loot box points. So you can use it for a whole bunch of different things, but also for power walls, solar roofs, and all that stuff on Amazon. Anyway, all of that is available in the description. Check it out. Help support the channel. In the meantime, I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.